Hey guys, uh, welcome to yet another episode of on Team Peachtree. It's uh, episode 43, can you believe it? And we're going to be dealing with the month of April. So the, the entire month of April will be episode 43, and then 44 will be May, 45 June, 46 July, right? I want to kick off this episode by asking kind of a seemingly simple and easy question. And we often find that the simple questions actually aren't that simple or easy. And the question is, um, what was eating at Vincent van Gogh, right? What was the, what was the problem? And uh, let's have a look at your, what you guys have said. So far, please vote if you haven't voted already. So far, 46% uh, say that he had syphilis. That was what was the problem. 8% say bipolar disorder. That's interesting. 15% say drank too much. 31% say he was lonely. So please make sure you vote if you haven't. Obviously, when I wrote this book, I um, was, what's the word? Um, I had to do the same thing that I do in true crime, which is figure out what the motives were and what the motivations were and who this person really was. So it's the typical thing in... Um, In, in true crime, which is, you know, who is this person? By the way, can you guys see me? Um, uh, StreamYard is sort of showing zero people in chat, but then I'm seeing comments. I'm not quite sure why it's doing that. Can you guys see me? Hello, do you see me? According to my dashboard, it says it's live. Let's get confirmation. You can see me. Okay. It's quite strange. It's saying zero viewers. Whereas on YouTube, um, showing 16. So I don't know. I'm not quite sure why it's doing that. Anyway, um, so. So that's really the question we want to start asking in April this month and May and June and July, right? And I did obviously address that in my book. I, I definitely addressed the the, um, <laughs> the the main thing that was that was um, haunting Van Gogh, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play you. You're not going to hear any audio. I'm going to play you a little bit from this is the moment in Painted with Words that the narrator addresses what's going on with Van Gogh. I'm going to provide you a little bit more insight on that. Um, but I think we're going to, I, I wanted to settle in your mind for a while. Um, I'll play a little bit more from this clip and then we'll address the issue a little bit later after a couple of letters. What do you think's going on with Van Gogh? There he is. The, there you see the date, 5th July, 1888. What do you think's going on with him? And the answer Van Gogh actually provides himself. You can go to the letter from the 5th of July, but the narrator correctly says, what is going on right here on the 5th of July had been going on since, since he arrived in all. What is that? So we're going to come back to that. Oh, so I see now StreamYard saying 26 of you in chat. That's that's a decent classroom size of uh, people listening in. Welcome to all of you. Um, okay, thanks a lot, Lisa. Okay, so we're going to come back to this. Um, I don't want to like just give you the answer. I want you guys to sort of think about it as well. So um, let's go to the letters. 
So that's just a reminder. I've written a book about this. I've obviously thought about it. I've researched. I've gone to, followed in his footsteps, literally gone to all, gone to Oves, who was, stood by his grave, um, visited the place where he slept in the last summer of his life. And so I've obviously thought about this. Okay, so we're going to kick off with this letter. I'm going to do it like that. And again, while we're reading through these letters, I want you to think about, he, he's not saying at, at this point what is wrong, what he's unhappy about, what do you think he is unhappy about. And obviously the answer only comes in at the after April, May, June, in early July. What do you think is accumulating and escalating of, through the month of April, May, June, July, basically the summer, the spring going into the summer. Okay, so let's get going. I hope my voice is going to hold up. My dear Theo, I'm in a fever of work since the trees are in blossom and I want to do a provincial orchard full of enormous brightness. Can you see, he doesn't have a problem with motivation. He's not depressed. He's not um, struggling with concentration, right? So he says, to write with a clear head presents serious difficulties. Yesterday I wrote some letters which I destroyed later. I keep on thinking that we must do something in Holland and that we must set about it with a vigor of whatever that is, with a French gaiety and worthy of the cause we are pleading. Here is a plan of attack which will cost us several of the best pictures you and I have made between us and certainly worth at least several thousand franc notes. He's kind of talking a big game, talking fairly big money. Bear in mind, he gets kind of like 50 francs a week or so from his brother. Now he's talking about several thousand francs. And obviously, it's not his money, right? So he says, it would be an answer in a clear voice to certain heavy insinuations treating us though we had already died. There's a, um, a clue to how he's actually feeling. He feels, um, this is how he feels society is treating him, right? As though he doesn't actually exist. He says, and a revenge for your trip last year when the welcome that they made you lacked any warmth. So even his brother, he feels, is not getting the credit he deserves. Suppose, therefore, that first of all, we gave to Jet Mauve the souvenir de Mauve, Suppose I dedicate a study to brightness. You kind of get the idea that this souvenir wasn't entirely out of the goodness of his heart, that there was almost a strategic value in painting this, right? It's, it's to give to the widows, uh, to give to um, the widow of the artist, but it's also to have a Van Gogh in this artist's... Um, What's the, what's the word? Um, home. So people visiting the home are probably going to see, oh, who painted that? So can you see there's something almost strategic about him doing that? I mean, in the middle of talking about thousand franc notes, the first thing he talks about is giving Jet Mauve the souvenir. So can you see there seems to be a strategic element to it? Then he says, suppose I dedicate a study to Breitner which I exchanged with Pissarro and the one readers. So that, that is something we learned about when he was in Paris, was that the artists would, if they couldn't sell their art, they would tend to exchange their art amongst one another. And so people that came into contact with a particular artist and they weren't interested in buying that artist's art would then come into contact with another artist's art via that same artist via this exchange program. Anyway, he says, suppose we gave another study to our sister. Suppose that we gave the modern museum in The Hague, since we have many memories of The Hague, the two views of Montmartre, so there it is, exhibited at the Independence. Uh, by the way, I actually lived in the, not lived, I stayed in The Hague for about a week when I visited the Netherlands in 2019. It's actually a lovely place to stay away from the Disneyland of Amsterdam. 
I wouldn't mind actually living there. Anyway, one thing remains, and quite interestingly, the World Criminal Court is based in The Hague as well. One thing remains not so easily settled. Since Tierstig has written you, send me some impressionists, but only those pictures that you yourself judge to be the best. And on your part, you sent a picture of mine in that consignment. I find myself in the not very easy position of having to convince Tierstig that really I am a true impressionist of the Petit Boulevard. So he, at this point, regards himself as an impressionist. You guys see that? And I mean, he would transcend impressionism and become an expressionist, right? And you can see there is something soft and although it's not classical, it's not classic impressionism, it's, it is, it is um, you know, it is something like that. I just want to um, read you guys the definition of expressionism. All right, and you can actually see um, the, you can see Starry Night there, you know, over there. Expressionism is art where the image of reality is distorted to make it expressive, right, of the artist's inner feelings or ideas, right? And so um, impressionism is also a distortion, but it's almost a distortion that, that, um, almost minimizes, if, if I can put it that way, ex expressionism intensifies uh, what you're seeing. Like it's a, it's a distortion that intensifies, whereas impressionism is one that makes it softer. Does that make sense? So let's put up the, so, so um, here is the, Google definition of impressionism, there you can see, um, I think that's Monet, or I think it's a Monet. It's going to say it could be Turner. You know, anyway, so it is Monet. Monet is the, a classic um, impressionist. So developed in France in the 19th century, it should really be mid 19th century, mid to late. It's based on the practice of painting out of doors spontaneously on the spot, which is what Van Gogh did as well. Um, doesn't really say what I'm hoping to see here. Uh, it says here, characterized by relatively small, thin, visible brush strokes. It's not quite what I'm looking for. Impressionists rebelled against um, classical subject matter, embraced modernity. Um, uniting them was a focus on how light could define a moment in time with color providing definition instead of black lines. And you can see that Van Gogh actually reverted to, to kind of black lines to, to quite a large extent. Um, Anyway, it's, it's quite strange. The definitions I'm seeing here are not the definitions I would, I would um, look at. It's not the way I would uh, define it. Anyway, um, he says, uh, oh, well, he will have a picture of mine in his own collection. I've been turning it over in my mind these days, and I've found an odd thing, not like what I do every day. It is the drawbridge with a ye little yellow card. That's this one. quite a quaint scene, isn't it? It's quite a, I mean, it's a kind of a cartoon of reality, but it's quite quaint. It's quite, um, there's something fairy tale and sweet about it. It's a sweet scene. It's a scene that you, you wish you, how can I put it? It's almost like I wish I was there kind of thing. And then Van Gogh takes you there. Anyway, he says, um, it only needs a frame specially designed for it in royal blue and gold in this fashion. Do you agree that at this point he's becoming, he's becoming the artist that he, he will one day become famous for? This is recognizably Van Gogh, right? Whereas some of the crap he did previously is 
crap, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, look how different that is to this. Can you see this is more impressionistic? This is more softer. Um, where the, the, the color is defining the scene. But it's almost like you're looking at it through a bathroom window. Whereas this is more, in my opinion, more expressionistic. And you can see it's using kind of outlines, almost like a cartoon. You see that? See how there's sort of outlines. So that's anyway how I how I see the difference. Uh, then he says, I can assure you that the work I do here is superior to than in the as near country last spring. In the whole plan, there's nothing absolutely fixed except the dedication to Souvenir de Mauve and the dedication to Tear Stick. I have not yet succeeded in writing a few words to explain it to him, but I will find find them when the painting is done. Can you see how the entire letter is? given over to painting strategy to, in a way, how to paint to make money to market to there's a, a method to to all of it. He's not simply painting. He's got kind of an overarching strategy in mind. And this is possibly what living in Paris and, and rubbing shoulders with other artists has taught him. And he keeps mentioning impressionists. That's the other thing that he learned by going to Paris. He didn't seem to really care about that before he arrived in Paris. And then suddenly he realized, wow, color is a big, big, big deal. And he totally changed his approach to art as a result of his time in Paris and his exposure to impressionism. But then he doesn't just copy the impressionists. He transitions through it into his own interpretation. He says, if you see Reed again, it would be good to tell him that we don't have a great deal of confidence in the success of ambitious people, and that we would like them better if they did good work, that we were surprised at his way of doing things, which ended up being inexplicable, and that since then we don't know what to think of him. Then he apparently wrote in the margin, for my part, I won't write to tear stick directly. If there's anything, I will send the letter to you with the paintings. I believe that Russell is trying to reconcile me with Reed and that he wrote the letter especially for that purpose. I shall certainly write to Russell and tell him that I told Reed frankly that he made a foolish mistake in loving dead pictures and to count for nothing living artists. And that is a... Uh, a reality with especially artists of his time as soon as they died the art was became a lot more valuable and that's 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 obviously what happened with van gogh right anyway uh, i mean van gogh is the classic example of an artist who after he died his art when he's alive his art literally worthless when he dies it's literally worth a fortune and becomes then almost invaluable, almost priceless. Ultimately, the portrait of Dr. Gachet at its, in its time became the most expensive artwork ever sold at auction. I think it auctioned for 90 to 100 million dollars. That's quite a lot of money. It's an unthinkable amount of money to Van Gogh in the situation he's in, where he's almost begging his brother for 50 francs at a time where he's eating, he has six or seven warm meals in a year and his teeth are falling out. You know, it's, he's, not, he's definitely not living the life that his art would later kind of deserve, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, expressionism was... Uh, some people say that Van Gogh is the father of Expressionism. It's funny, I, I had a conversation with my brother and he was talking about another artist. I'm not sure if it was Picasso, but he was talking about another artist who he felt, my brother felt, was the actually the, the real father of Expressionism. But anyway, uh, Wheatfield with Crows is regarded as um, almost the first 
painting in that uh, oeuvre, right? Uh, oeuvre, I think is how you say it. But then uh, Starry Night is as well. Anyway, um, in, in other words, it's painting almost something that you're feeling um, on top of reality. So if you are looking at the stars and you're feeling emotional and you're feeling restless or whatever, then, then that trumps the reality in front of you, right? And of course, in a world where there's photography, that kind of interpreting is necessary. It's necessary to see beyond the photographic thing. And anyway, Impressionism was, was, was in a, uh, what's the word, not a downturn, but it was a, a starting to peter out. So Van Gogh um, added to the, the art, art narrative that was evolving. That's not easy to do. Then he says, I had to spend almost the whole amount on colors and canvas as soon as your letter came. And I wish you could manage as soon as possible to send me something soon. The painting of the garden with the lovers is at the Theater Libre. Boyer, the famous as the lithograph of mine, the old man with the bald head. Yeah, okay. Some people think that this image is a sign that Van Gogh is suicidal. You know, they look at it and they say, oh, that must mean he's depressed. But that's just a reference he made to that painting. He's simply saying, by the way, that picture of mine is with that person. <laughs> that's the only reference he's making to it. So um, there's something else I wanted to point out. Oh, what is quite amazing with Van Gogh is how much he suffers for his art. And what I mean by that is he buys color when he can't afford to eat. His health is suffering because he's spending more money buying expensive colors. So in other words, if he, he can almost choose between, um, I can either buy, buy poo colors that are maybe cheaper. I can buy poo green and poo brown, and I can have festivals of poo, you know, like brown potatoes and whatever, or I can buy all of these other colors, but then I can't have sugar in my coffee, and I can't have a croissant, I'm going to have to have a dry biscuit. Do you know what I'm saying? Th that is incredible commitment for someone to basically do that, right? It's incredible commitment to give up like a nice meal because you are so caught up in I need I need color right that is a um, real commitment do you, do you see that yeah it definitely was the true definition of that and you know so if he wanted to make his life easy for himself he could continue painting poo colors but what he does is he's, he he insists on and you're going to see in the very next letter he orders a variety of colors and, and it doesn't make his, his life easier with Theo. Every time Theo's got to carry that burden as well. And the thing is he's not trying he's not trying he's not trying to make things easier on himself. He's following his um, not only his heart but he's following kind of a gut feel on what um, what needs to be expressed through color in the way that he intuitively sees it, right? Okay, so he says, I should like I should like it if what I'm going to send you reached you before Tiersti goes to Paris, and if you could put the blooming apple trees in your room. I'm very glad that it is working out all right with Kuning and that you are not alone. What a pity about Bignon. So that there's a quite an interesting reference there. I'm glad that you are not alone. What a pity about Vignon. I'm sure um, Monsieur Genre was behind it. And I, excuse me, I wish him, I wish him the bad luck that he has brought on other people. That's quite an unusually bitter um, Bob from Van Gogh. He is usually not nasty. 
uh, he usually doesn't really have a nasty word to say about anyone. And here is a bit of a barb. I, I wish him the bad luck he's brought on other people. I can't yet manage to write you the kind of letter I want to. The work absorbs me completely. So you can see he's actually even quite committed when he writes a letter. If he can't say things the way he wants to, he tears the letter up. Um, and he says that here. He says, I wrote some letters which I destroyed later. So can you see he's kind of a perfectionist? He, he's got a high standard for himself. I mean, no one... No one's going to pay him for the letters he's writing to his brother. And he doesn't know these letters are going to be published one day. He simply wants to communicate to a certain standard to his brother. And that same standard carries over to his art. He also wants to express himself crisply in his art through the colors he uses. But this is especially to tell you that I, wanted, I want to do some studies particularly for Holland. And after that, we'll leave Holland alone forever. The last few days, I've been more moved than was reasonable, perhaps, thinking about Mauve and Wissen, Weissenbruch, Tierstick and Mother and Vol. And it steadies me to tell myself that there'll be some pictures going down there. So I think what he means is he's been feeling a little emotional. Uh, you know, there's an artist relative of his has died. Um, he's hoping to get the approval of Tierstick, and he's also trying to, he's now got to prove himself. He's in the south of France, and now he's got to prove what he can do. So there's kind of quite a lot of pressure on him. He says, it steadies me to tell myself that there, there'll be some pictures going down there. Then afterwards, I shall forget them and think only of the Petit Boulevard. It's quite interesting that the end of the letter is missing. One wonders what was in the end of that. Okay, so the next letter deals with an order. Uh, it's the 4th of April. There's the order. He asks for, um, sorry, let's do it like that. Uh, he asks for flake white, zinc white, malachite green. There's a kingfisher in South Africa called the Malachite kingfisher. It's got like a burnished metal um, coloring. Chrome yellow. Uh, you can see the ones quite a lot of chrome yellow. Chrome yellow, chrome yellow, chrome yellow. Vermilion, germanium, germanium lake, crimson lake, carmine, Prussian blue, cinnabar green, orange lead, emerald green. And he says, this is a pretty heavy order. I, I realize this is going to be expensive, um, but it's urgent. Uh, please, can you send this to me? And then he adds some more. Flake white, malachite green, chrome yellow, that, that, vermilion, and so on and so on. And so he talks about expenses and paints. He says, I still have another orchard for you, but for heaven's sake, send me the paints without delay. The flowering time is over so soon. So can you see how what's kind of going on is there's a there's color bursting around him, like literally. When he steps out, you know, there are literally trees in blossom all over the place. And he feels like, well, I need color. I need, I've got to capture that. And And look at all the, you know, it might be, pink on the one tree and, and, and sort of, I don't know, purple on the other tree and this color and that color and all these flowers blooming. I know when I was there in May and I've actually got a picture on my wall downstairs, um, there were lots of red poppies and that is something that he painted occasionally as well. They, they grow wild there. Um, in fact, I took quite a, I actually jumped onto the railway track because there were poppies growing between the track and the bottom. And um, a, like a railway police came running, you know. And I was like, I, I'm just trying to take a photo. Um, anyway, so um, he says, as soon as I can pay for the packing um, and carriage, the ladder will certainly be cheaper at the small station here than carriage forward at the Garde Lyon. 
um, manifestation in Paris. I'll send you the studies. Haven't ascended at the moment, as I told you before. So can you see he's saying, I need colors, I need paints. Please send me paints. And he's got, he doesn't have any money for anything else. That's commitment. Do what you can, but anyway, oh, let's get the discount on the paints. Ever yours, Vincent. I'm rather curious to know what you think of my first batch, which will certainly contain at least 10 canvases. Okay. So we go into the next letter. Every month has got about eight letters. And what does that tell you? It tells you he's, paint, he's, he's writing about three letters a week, a little, little less than three letters a week, which is almost a letter every second or third day. It's quite a lot. Let's see if I can just uh, be a bit more accurate on that. Um, if we just look at this chronology. So if we go to, that's March, this is April, where we are now, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it's 10 letters in that month, and, and a lot more the next month. 10 letters in April, so it's really one letter every third day, that's quite a lot. This is probably closer to a letter every second day. And over here, uh, about the same letter every second day. Look how many letters are there, right? That's a crap load of letters. And and 1888 is the year that he writes by far the most letters. Every dot is a letter there. And and then this is where the ear incident happens around this mark. So you can see it starts dropping off dramatically over there. But shitload of letters there. A lot of letters. A lot of letters. And it's starting to pick up right where we are now. That's February. That's March. So it's doubled from February. Uh, and this is where we are in April. It's picking up. But in the next month, it's, it's going to double. And so, again, the, my question to you is, what's starting to eat at Vincent? He's painting. He's motivated. What's, what's the problem, though? What, what is actually going on? What do you guys say? Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. So I'm going to play you. Um, I'm going to play you just this section, although you can't hear it. And then I'm going to just tell you what is being said. So you, you're, you're seeing uh, Benedict Cumberpatch uh, playing Vincent van Gogh, he's sitting at a restaurant, and and then what do you think he's saying? Does he look happy? What do you think he's thinking about? What do you think's going on? This is July 1888, which we, going a bit forward in time. Okay. Stephanie says, I think I got the poll wrong. I, I put loneliness. So the interesting thing is, let's just have a look at the poll right now. Um, see where we are. I think I need to... So 28% say syphilis, 19% say bipolar, 12% say drank too much, 41, most of you say that he was lonely. Okay. So I'm going to address one of those now and we'll, we'll come back to it. The narrator in Painted with Words says he was clearly suffering from bipolar disorder, right? If you look at bipolar disorder, what are the symptoms? Right? They are feeling sad, hopeless, or irritable most of the time. Do, do you think that's how he's feeling? Do you get a sense of that in his letters? Does he seem hopeless or irritable in his letters? If you've voted for bipolar, 
then this is the, the moment you need to defend your case. So based on what we've, and you, you might say, well, you've only read one or two letters. So we'll read another letter and then you can look out for it. But you kind of get the sense that he's feeling hopeless. You kind of get the sense that he's feeling sad so far in this letter. Does he seem irritable? He did make a rare irritated remark saying he hopes someone pays for something, but that's kind of quite exceptional. Is he lacking energy? Does he have difficulty concentrating? You might say, yeah, well, he had to, he tore up quite a few letters and he wrote them again. Okay, but the letters we've just gone through, we orders paints when he asks for this and he talks about that. Uh, is that a, is it a succinct letter or, or not? I mean, uh, if you want to look at an incoherent statement, it's, it's that dude we dealt with in the Stephen Smith case. His Facebook posts are completely incoherent. Is this anything like that? Does, has Van Gogh lost interest in everyday activities? Is he struggling with feelings of emptiness or worthlessness? Does he say, Theo, I'm painting this, but you know what? I don't think I'm going to get anywhere. I just I don't think we're going to be able to sell any of this. Does he have feelings of guilt or despair about anything? Is he feeling pessimistic about everything? Does he have self-doubt? So I see a lot of no's, and, and, and I agree with you. It's, it's, that's, it's definitely not bipolar. Here's another definition of bipolar. It's previously known as manic depression. It's characterized by periods of depression, of abnormally elevated mood. And, and then here's the, not that this is um, the be all end all, but here's the, here's the um, longer definition. And uh, I, I, th I think the, the reason why they associate Van Gogh with bipolar is a kind of reverse engineering of his psychology because it's the risk of suicide is high over a period of 20 years, 6%, there you go. So people are kind of going, oh, that was how, that was how he died, so he must have had bipolar. It's, it's kind of reverse engineering from the end result, right? And again, that just shows you how poor the, the, the diagnosis of so-called experts is in terms of this. Because if you've got any common sense, if you've got a little bit of brain between your ears, you can see that there's no, there's no trace of bipolar in his letters. Um, do you guys agree with that? There's just no trace of it. And so the um, part that I've just played for you, the, um, the narrator says he was clearly suffering from bipolar disorder. And then that is how you get a, a misdiagnosis. You have an authoritative documentary like this, and then I did a presentation at a book fair uh, on the South African coast. At, I think it was the Ramsgate Book Festival. And I was giving my assessment on what happened to Van Gogh. And afterwards, about five people came up to me and they said, D didn't you think it was bipolar disorder? And I was like, where did you get that dumb idea? I didn't say that, but I was like, where did you get such, where, who told you that? Because that's nonsense. And this is one potential source for that. Okay, so um, so you can strike off the list um, bipolar disorder. Um, that's that just shouldn't be there at all. But I put it there because of this documentary. Um, he drank too much, that is true. Uh, he was drinking too much be even before he came to all. And he 
he did drink more and more and more and more. Um, but what's the reason that he's drinking too much? Is he drinking too much because he's got syphilis? So anyway, we're, we're going to come back to this, this issue. The thing that you can't hear in this moment Sorry, it's this moment. Okay, I'm, I, I'm actually going to leave that for a bit later. We, we'll deal with that a little bit later. Uh, let's go back to the letter. One does wonder if Van Gogh didn't have a brother to write to, what would have happened to him? You know, he was in a fragile state in a way. Um, if he didn't have a brother either to write to or to look out for him or to look after him, one, one does wonder what ultimately would have happened. And I think there are two possibilities. One is a certain form of self-destruction, whether it's drinking or whatever. And the other one is that he might have gotten a job and become a productive member of society. Maybe he would have become a journalist or something. Or a construction worker, or a, a a farmer, a farm worker, or something. You know, um, the fact that his brother kept giving him money meant that he was to some extent dependent, and all he could do was paint. You know, that was sort of it. Okay, so let's continue. April 9th, eighteen eighty eight. My dear Theo, thank you for your letter and the 100 franc note it contained. So Theo is not only buying his brother art supplies, colors, he's also sending him money so that he can um, eat, sleep, and do whatever. He says, I've sent you sketches of the paintings destined for Holland. Of course, the painted studies are more brilliant in color. I'm once again hard at it, still orchards in blossom. The air here certainly does me good. I wish you could fill your lungs with it. One effect it has on me is comical enough. One small glass of cognac makes me tipsy here. So there's a admission that he's, he's drinking. The fact that he just mentions it probably means he's drinking a lot more than, than he's saying. But it's quite interesting that he, he, he's mentioned in the previous letters the wind quite a few times, and now he mentions the air. He says, I don't have to fall back on stimulants to make my blood circulate. There will be less strain on my constitution. The only thing is that my stomach has been terribly weak since I came here. Right? So you might say that's been eating at him. Why is his stomach weak? But after all, that's probably only a matter of time. I hope to make great progress this year, and indeed I need to. That tells you what he's identity is what is uh, inner how is inner directed not i don't think i can make progress i don't think anyone's going to buy my work um i'm I, I know i should work but i'm i'm tired or whatever it is is saying i hope to make progress and i need to make progress so he's motivated there's not a problem with that He's got energy, despite the fact that his stomach's not, not in a great place. He says, I have another orchard as good as the pink peach trees, apricot trees of a very pale pink. At the moment, I'm working on some plum trees, yellowish white with thousands of black branches. So he's, he's, um, he's kind of part of Team Peach Tree at this point. He's, he's, he's painting peach trees, plum trees, apricot trees, and I think even apple trees as well, all of them in blossom. I'm using a tremendous lot of colors and canvases, you can imagine, but all the same, I hope it isn't a waste of money. Out of four canvases, perhaps one at the most will make a painting, like the one for Tears to Gormo. When can I send you anything? I have a great mind to do a second version, blah, blah, blah. Yesterday, oh, this is really interesting. Yesterday, I saw another bullfight where five men worked the bull with darts and cockades. 
One Toreador crushed a, a ball in jumping the barricade. I think what he means by ball is, you know, what I, I think he means those balls, right? Uh, he was a blonde man with gray eyes and lots of sang. Uh, how did they say that? Um, let me um, do it this way. Song Fua. There you go. Song Fua. And if you're in America? Song Fua. Okay. This is how you say it if you're in the UK. Song Fua. And if you're in America? Song Fua. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I get almost jittery when it comes to pronunciation because the pronunciation police are pretty, they're pretty active out there. So uh, you, you may remember that I told you that there's a Roman amphitheater. Well, that is what they were using it for at the time. Uh, I wonder if I can show you some images from that. That's no, not that. Um, uh, let's just do it like this. I think now might be a good, good moment just to go to... Um, some of the photos. I, I don't know if I've got. Looks like I don't have any of the bull ring, but I'll maybe put some up in a moment. I've got a picture very similar to this on my staircase at home. Um, I think I took this photo on my first day in all. Um, you can see it's a very old courtyard. Um, and so I put a bit of a yellow tint on it just to make it a little bit less gloomy. Um, and then I also made sure that I got this lamp so that you could see it um, silhouetted in this white space. So it's not this picture, but another one that I've got in my uh, stairway. Uh, that is the Pont van Gogh. Um, I think I had to go over this uh, there's a bridge you had to go over this bridge to get to where I was staying, which is somewhere in this area. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, you can see a couple of boats there. And obviously, Van Gogh was not far from this um, canal himself, which is which goes into the Rhone, which is much wider. Um, hence, he painted the Lang Langlois Bridge pretty early on. Not sure what that's about. So let me know if you can hear the audio here. This is just a scene that I recorded in the middle of all. At night, obviously. So, by the way, that is the, that's a part of the amphitheater sticking out over there, if I remember correctly. That's part of the amphitheater. Can you guys uh, hear the, hear the sound? So that's the that's the amphitheater over there. So that is where he went to watch this bullfight going on. And I, I don't think you can do that. I could be wrong. As far as I know, you they don't have bullfights anymore. But as, that's I, I say that under correction. So 
this is the you know the the town square uh, not quite the very center but it's a little bit off center you can see how the wind is kind of a constant factor it's constantly whispering it's constantly moving it's constantly tugging right and um, if you had to turn the camera around what you would see w would be me and what what is going on there i'm walking alone by myself through all recording this trying to channel van gogh what do you think is part what do you think i'm channeling um how can i put it what do you think i'm channeling along with van gogh or as part of van gogh what do you think it feels like when you are you're alone at night and the wind sort of blowing and it's kind of cold can you see anyone else in this picture and I purposefully uh, directed the camera upwards to the trees to give you um, a little because you kind of get the sense that Van Gogh was looking up into the night sky quite often. That's why he painted Star Starry Night over the Rhone and Starry Night. He was looking up into the sky. What do you think he's thinking when he's doing that? He's looking at looking and perhaps listening at the to the wind but what do you think is thinking and feeling uh in this sort of situation so uh someone says alls isn't crazy wild with people well i was there not in the tourist season and, and i was purposefully not there in the tourist season i was there in early may sort of mid-may 2019 fortunately just before the pandemic so um in the day there were there were actually quite a few tourists uh you may remember i showed you a picture of the bridge and then the, one moment it's calm and quiet and the next thing a bus stops and 20 30 um, tourists, Asian tourists sort of get off and then that whole um, uh, atmosphere is gone instantly. People taking photos, whatever, they don't they didn't really move around much. Next thing the bus comes back back onto the bus, off they went. So I had a totally different experience to them. And I also think Van Gogh had a totally different experience to them. Okay, if only the trees could talk. So there's another picture taken around the corner from the bridge. Um, I'm going to perhaps spoil this to tell you, but that is actually not the original bridge that he painted. That that's kind of a recreated, uh, recreated bridge. Um, they actually the Germans blew up the original Langlois bridge. I don't know whether it was originally here. Um, I, I don't know exactly where it originally was, but um, you know, it certainly is in a way disappointing that um, the reality we know today is to some extent artificial anyway. That's not the original bridge. That's not where it was or how it was, but they, they have at least made the effort to to put something there. Uh, this is the inside of the hospital, you know, after he lost his ear, he was treated in this hospital and then he went to the asylum a uh, couple of months later, weeks to months later. So this is where he was treated. And then he also painted the interior of this hospital. Quite interesting that the hospital's original um, what's the word, decor was yellow and blue. It's quite interesting. And yellow and blue featured prominently in terms of Vincent's um, painting. Think about Starry Night. I mean, think about this. I mean, that's yellow and blue. 
and watch this right you see what i'm saying just uh interesting to note okay so maybe it holds some uh, symbolic significance personal uh, symbolic significance for him this is the abbey uh just another view of that abbey which is like a quarter of the way to saint Rami. that's a, just another view you can see some really old buildings in the area uh that's the same picture that's i think behind me there's there's the bike that i was using and i think these are olive groves and these obviously feature prominently in his art especially during the saint Rami period right um, that's me in the Netherlands, um, and that's the very famous um, girl with a pearl earring by Vermeer. I mean, that's the original painting. Um, I think I did something silly. Um, I was, so there was a lady who's edited my books before. She was acting like a tour guide. She took this photo. I think I posed, um, pretending to kiss the girl with the pearl earring, but the picture didn't really come out very well. Um, anyway, at least I didn't throw oil on it or what tomato, tin tomatoes. This is a, not a terribly good picture of me, but this is in Newnan. And there's my book in the, um, what do you call it, in the window. Um, that there's my book being exhibited in the window. And that's 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 one of the more um, beautiful pictures that he painted, but but this is reaching around about midsummer of Van Gogh. Okay, yeah, it is a good painting. I also like it. And so this is what all those colors were all about. I need blue. I need yellow. I need green. This is what it's all about. Can you see how it's got those black outlines? Impressionism doesn't have it. So this is like Impressionism plus one. It's kind of going, taking the lead from Impressionism into another sort of area, right? Okay, so um, let's go back to the letter. Okay, so we're talking about Sans foi. Okay. He was a blonde man with grey eyes and lots of... Sans foi. People said he'll be ill long enough. He was dressed in sky blue and gold, just like the little horseman in our Monticelli, the three figures in a wood. The arenas are a fine sight when there's sunshine and a crowd. So he's literally talking about this arena, and that's I went to sit in that arena, also recorded video there. I don't know where it is. It might actually be on my Instagram, uh, but it, you've got to go back so far in time now. But I did I did take photos inside the that arena. Um, it's actually quite a tall structure for something that's like a thousand years old. It's quite a tall building and quite a big stadium. And anyway, so that's where he was. You can imagine he's surrounded by people. He is in this big stadium filled with people. And he's talking about what he saw. And the amazing thing is when Van Gogh actually painted a bullfighter. I think he, he, he painted it for the first time when Gorgar was with him. Then he, he didn't actually paint anything that you see on the field. Let me see if I can bring it up quickly. So this was painted in December, November or December 1888. So although he's referring to it, shall I bring it up? Although he's referring to it in April, early April, he only paints it 
a couple of months later. And what's so strange is, uh, it, to me, it's like he, he misses the point completely. He, he paints the people in the arena rather than what's going on in the arena. And, and like that to me is quite terrible. Like, is that supposed to be a cow? You know, he doesn't really paint what's going on in the arena. He paints the crowd. Strange, isn't it? He's um, kind of interested in the crowd and in these ladies. But there's like no interest in what's actually going on in the field. I mean, that is terrible. Is it, that's supposed to be a cow or a bull. So he seems to see all of that as secondary. See what I'm saying? You see, I mean, that's all painted in, I don't know whether in his mind he sees that as covered in dust, but uh, I find it quite a, quite a lousy picture, to be honest. Is that supposed to be, is that like a stick man? You know, it's just a very lazy, I don't know whether it's an unfinished picture, but uh, I mean, there as well. So he puts quite a lot of effort into the crowd, especially over here and again he, he seems to be quite interested in the the woman of all that's a woman that's a woman that's a woman that looks like a woman with a child that's a woman with a back to him there's a guy with a hat um it looks like there are quite a few people with these sort of red umbrellas there are a couple as well and then look how lazy that execution is um What's that all about? See what I'm saying? So it is quite curious that he only gets round to, and look how bad that is. I mean, what's that yellow stick figure there? Look at that. Does it look like, is that a, is that supposed to be someone's head? So anyway, the point is, this is the busy spectator scene that, that he was surrounded with when he wrote this letter, right? Um, and, and so he sees something that's quite spectacular, but he doesn't actually bother to paint it. Maybe he can't paint it. Maybe his skill isn't that great. He, he says the arenas are a fine sight when there's sunshine and a crowd. Uh, then he says, then he changes the subject. Bravo for Pissarro. I think he's right. I hope he will make an exchange with us one day. I just want to see if there's a, a really good execution of, so here is, I just want to see if there's a, a, a very good execution of, um, uh, of a, of a bullfight by a different artist. So here is um, Edouard Manet, and uh, this is what it looks like. In fact, Manet looks like done quite a few. Let's just quickly have a look at a few. I'm just saying that he could have done a much better job. I think. Uh, I mean, look at what other artists have done. That's um, something you could view at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, by Mary Cassay, I guess. Right? Uh, that's the way that she executes it. She paints it, uh, what do they call them? A troubadour. Um, I doubt whether he painted it on site. Um, doubt whether he took his artwork into the, into this, the stadium. I doubt it. Um, Yaris Manet, I look at this. 
um, Edward Manet, and he, this was when he went to Spain. Um, look how much better that is than, than Vincent's effort. Right? Much better effort. So can you see um, Van Gogh is quite good at landscapes. Uh, I, I, I just wonder why I didn't even bother to paint something that, that was exciting enough to mention at some length in the letter because he paints a lot of things that he seems to see. Okay. He says, um, I'm working hard, hoping that we can do something with things of this kind. This month will be a hard time for both you and me. And if you can manage it, it will be to our advantage to make the most we can of the orchards in blue. I'm well started now, and I think I must have 10 more, the same subject. You know I'm changeable in my work, and this craze for painting orchards will not last forever. So he's in a kind of a... Um, what's the word? He's focused just on painting orchards. And so when he goes to this bull fight, he it's like, no, 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 I'm painting orchards. And who knows if he painted, put a lot of effort like he put into the potato eaters, who knows, maybe people would have be appreciated when the whole crowd are there to watch the bullfight. Maybe that's the kind of thing they want to hang in their homes. Bullfights, not orchards. He says, then I must do a tremendous lot of drawing because I want to make some drawings in the manner of Japanese prints. So th that tells you the kind of style he is drawn to, and that is the style that he um, is executing. They kind of have that cartoonish look about them. He says, there's nothing like striking while the iron is hot. I shall be all in when the orchards are over for their size 25 and 30 and 20 canvases. We should not have too many of them, even if I could knock off twice as many. Can you see he's really motivated? It seems to me that this may really break the ice in Holland. Merv's death was a terrible blow to me. You know, what is so incredible is he writes far more about Merv's death and what he needs to do and, 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 and so on than, than about his own father's death. Did you, did you notice that? Anyway, he says, you will see that the pink peach trees were painted with a certain passion. I must have, I, I must also have a starry night with cypresses. So can you see he's already thinking in that vein? He's thinking of a starry night scene painted in um, April 1888. You know, he will eventually paint starry night about a year after this. So, so it's kind of like if you're talking about premeditated art, he's already seeing stars um, at this point. He says, or perhaps above all, a field of ripe corn. There are some wonderful nights here, right? And what he means by that is the, the light is clear. There's no smoke. You can see the stars. Um, you feel the wind, you feel alive at night. There's a wonderful atmosphere. I'm very curious to know what the result will be at the end of the year, at, at the end of a year. Um, I wonder what he would say or do if you could tell him the answer. I wonder what he would say if you told him, well, you know what the result is? Catastrophe. You're going to lose your ear, be kicked out of town, and end up in an asylum. Uh, what do you think of that? He says, I hope by that time I shall be less bothered with breakdowns. And so what do you think he means by that? Do you think he's having breakdowns? Do you think he's having some kind of emotional breakdown? He says, at present I feel pretty bad some days, but I don't worry about it in the least as it is nothing but the reaction after last winter, which was out of the ordinary. And my blood is coming right. That is a great thing. So... Let me ask you again, what do you think he means by breakdown? Do you think he's talking about an emotional breakdown? Do you think he's talking about like a mental breakdown? What, 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 what does he mean by that? Stephanie, Stephanie, you're 100% right. 
he's, he's worried that his health is going to give in and that's going to cause a breakdown in his work, right? So he's conscious that he's not well. He's conscious that, and obviously not having a good diet plus drinking, um, you know, so he's willing to sacrifice his health in order to get the colors that he wants. He's not eating very well and so, and he's drinking excessively and so his health is suffering. So if we, we go to the um, poll, so I see 40 people have voted. 25% um, say equal to the number of saying bipolar disorder uh, that his number one problem was that he had syphilis. Actually, he's managing his syphilis. He doesn't know that he's got syphilis, but he knows that his health is kind of undermined. He can feel that his stomach's weak. He can feel that there's a weakness going on in him that um, is a factor. He's, he's aware that he, he, if he pushes himself too hard, he can face a physical breakdown, right? So... So um, the fact that he's drinking is a factor. It's not the number one factor, though. The fact that he's got syphilis is a factor. It's not the number one factor, though. And the, the fact that the whole bipolar thing is a non-fact, it's total nonsense. Um, so what does that leave you with? And the interesting thing in the clip that I played you is, in his own letter, he says... Let me go to that clip quickly. In this moment, on the 5th of July, he says, the only people I ever talk to are the waiters when I order breakfast or dinner. He says, I can go a week without talking to anyone. Right? And then, inexplicably, the person who's narrating this says, this is a classic sign of bipolar disorder. Huh? <laughs> No, it's a classic sign of loneliness. It's a classic freaking sign of loneliness. I've got no one to talk to. Um, and because I've got no one to talk to, I write a shitload of letters. And I write a shitload of letters throughout 1888. I've never written more letters than in 1888. And 1889 and 1890. He's lonely. It's not, it's not any disorder. Is loneliness a disorder? Right? And so this is what is so pathetic with art experts and the, I don't know, the whole crowd who diagnose Van Gogh with these advanced uh, whatever disorders or, or whatever it is. No, 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 he's actually just struggling with loneliness. And because he's lonely, he drinks. And because he's lonely, um, he has kind of got a lot of time to work. And um, and his his um, the focus of his attention is on he's trying to work his almost work his way out of loneliness if that's the answer he is um, how can I put it he's Focus isn't on that I'm lonely. His focus is on working, almost as a distraction from that. Um, the other thing, the syphilis is also, to some extent, a consequence of him being lonely. Because he's lonely, he goes to a brothel. Because he's lonely, he pays a, a woman to either sit for a portrait or whatever it is, right? Because he's lonely. So the, the drinking and the syphilis or kind of a, put it this way, if he was married, do you think he would have syphilis? If he was married and, he, and his wife was cooking for him and he was eating properly, then these other things would go away. So, so the primary problem he's facing is loneliness. And so it's quite a simple question, right? It's quite a simple question. What's the thing that is eating at him and it's getting worse every day, every week, every month, throughout the, the, um, the summer, and then gets even worse as we head up to Christmas and it, it culminates in him losing his ear.
right? And he loses his ear around the question of Gorga saying, dude, I've, I've got to get out of here. My art's selling in Paris. See ya. And so Van Gogh is really, really lonely. And so the art experts say he was so lonely that he cut off his ear. But there's another interpretation. He's so lonely that he doesn't want Gorga to leave him. So he's like, please don't leave me. You, you can't leave me. And so what do you think Gorga does? Do you think Gorga just is like, keep pulling out my shirt, don't, uh, you know, it's, it's fine. What do you think happens? So it's, to me, crazy that you have art experts and you have people like the guy who made this documentary that, that they can't see like what's right in front of them. They can't see reality. And um, it's, Weird how that same thing translates to true crime. People see the reality they want to see. Um, sometimes it's very simplistic, often it is. Sometimes it's very reductionist, often it is. And so when I went to all by myself, that's the way you should do it if you want to visit Van Gogh, if you want to follow in his footsteps, go there by yourself. If you go into all by yourself and you walk around at night by yourself and you feel the wind blowing by yourself and you stand in the places where he painted by yourself and you see some beautiful scenes by yourself and you pass by restaurants where that are full of people by yourself, then you you feel the weight, the burden of the loneliness that he felt. If you go from all to Saint Rami by yourself you feel the landscape in a way that he felt it, right? And so where's that? Um, so when you watch this, you should be feeling that loneliness. So if you are in or with someone, all of this is terribly romantic. Um, it's terribly, you feel terribly sophisticated, um, you know, going in, you, you're in this area and you with the other people as well, and you're having a cup of coffee. And there's so much to see, and it's all very interesting. But if you're there on your own, and you see all these people um, with somebody else doing whatever they're doing um, because it's so um, beautiful and atmospheric and meaningful and scenic you get a really strong sense of I wish I could share this with someone and I'm sure he felt that way I'm sure he, I'm, I think he's already said it to Theo you should really come and see this and do, do you guys remember um, what um, was it Chris Chris McCandless wrote that guy who, who went out into the wild in the in the book uh krakauer's book into the wild he said happiness is only real when shared right that was the thing that he felt he was in that bus and he and he was there for like 99 days or whatever it was and um what he realized was how lonely he was and he actually wrote that down Right? And then he realized like the profound thing that he, the profound lesson that he learned from that experience was happiness is only real when shared. And Van Gogh has just come from Paris with a cacophony of people there, um, having the companionship of his brother, which in the end they were at loggerheads. Suddenly he's in all and suddenly it's back to the same thing. He's all by himself. I think when he left Paris, he wasn't thinking about being alone. I think he was just, um, well, I'm not sure what he was thinking about. Maybe just that 
he couldn't stay with his brother anymore. But now I think he's feeling the loneliness, right? Okay, so let's go back to the letter. Um, uh, but let me know, do you guys agree with my assessment or do you think, um, no, I, I, I disagree. Uh, what do you guys think? Verbal judo says, I'm the very opposite and enjoy my alone time. So he says, I must reach the point where my pictures will cover my expenses and even more than that, taking into account how much was spent in the past. Okay, come home. Come. <laughs> to me, it's feeling a little lonely. To me, so hello. See, even dogs can feel lonely. He says, I don't make a success of everything, I admit, but I'm getting on. So far, you have not complained of my expenses here, but I warn you that if I continue to work at the same rate, I shall have great difficulty in making both ends meet, but the work is heavy indeed. If there should happen to be a month or a fortnight where, when you were hard-pressed, let me know and I will set to work on some drawings, which will cost us less. So he's trying to meet his brother halfway, try, trying to kind of, um, what's the word, manage um, the expenses. He says to his brother, don't put yourself out unnecessarily. There's so much to do here, all sorts of studies. Not the way it is in Paris where you can't sit down wherever you want. If you can finance a rather heavy month, so much the better, since orchards in bloom are the kind of thing when there's some chance of selling or exchanging. Well, that, that ended up being a wrong um, approach. He didn't sell any of those orchards. One does wonder if he'd spent a bit more time paying attention to those bullfights. Who knows? It occurred to me that you have to pay your rent, so you must tell me if things are too steep. So here he is actually saying to his brother, you know what, tell me if I'm, I'm demanding too much. I'm still going, again, is that somebody who's got some kind of disorder that they can't think clearly? Um, anyway, he says, I'm still going about with the Danish painter all the time, but he's going home soon. He's an intelligent boy and all right as far as fidelity and manners go. But his painting is rather spineless. You will probably see him when he passes through Paris. Not a very nice thing to say, is it? You did well to go see Bernard uh, if he goes to serve in Algiers. So it looks like Bernard's, Bernard has joined the military. Who knows that I might go there too to keep him company. So I don't know, you kind of get the idea, is he thinking about joining the military? Is it really over at last this winter in Paris? I think what Khan said is very true, that I've not sufficiently considered values, but they'll be saying very different things in a little while, and no less true. It isn't possible to get values and color. Rousseau did it better than anyone else, and with the mixing of his colors, the darkening caused by time has increased and his pictures are now unrecognizable. You can't be at the pole and the equator at the same time. You must choose your own line as I hope to do, and it will probably be color. That speaks volumes. What he means by that is you must find your own voice. You must find your own way. And he says his way is probably color. Goodbye for the present and shake to you and the comrades. <coughs> Okay. It's a good point from Yvonne. <clears throat> yeah, he is very occupied. And so the question is, is working hard going to push away the loneliness monster? Is it going to keep him away? Maybe... It'll do that in April, 
how about May? How about till June, July? And um, and then the other thing is, you know, at some point things are getting a bit tough. It doesn't really have a couple of drinks, and then reality starts to intrude. Uh, tomorrow says, did, did he ever fall in love? Uh, we fell in love with his cousin, his neighbor. Uh, he fell in love with a prostitute uh, that was pregnant and he wanted to marry her. Um, so, and, and I believe he fell in love with Dr. Geshe's daughter as well. Okay, so let's deal with this one. This is quite a nice painting, isn't it? You can imagine, uh, you know, all those colors that he's asked for. Well, there, there are quite a few here. Blue, green, yellow, brown, orange. Quite colorful, um, not terribly successful. He seems to like putting gray all over the place. Okay. Okay. So this is a letter to Bernard. Uh, it's a mutual friend between him and Paul Gauguin. Thanks for your kind letter and for the enclosed sketches of your decoration, which I think very funny. Sometimes I regret that I cannot make up my mind to work more at home and extempore. The imagine so he's saying, I wish I could work from home more. The imagination, and this is the line that I use in the title for this video. The imagination is certainly a faculty which we must develop, one which alone can lead us to the creation of more exalting and consoling nature than the single brief glance at reality. That in a nutshell is expressionism. He's saying, I want to paint reality, but I want to, I want to superimpose my imagination over it. I want to intensify the color. I want to make, I want to put emotion into the, the waving of the grasses and the wheeling of the clouds, the, the whirling of the clouds, right? He's saying a single brief glance at reality, um, you need something more than that, something that is more exalting and consoling. And so that is the, that is the message he's trying to, um, convey in his paintings, exalting at the joy of life and the exuberance of nature and the consoling um, touch of nature. You know, when haven't you sometimes felt you kind of in a daydream and a, a slight breeze picks up and it brushes your forehead or whatever, and, and, and um, if you've got a hair, it... it um, causes your head to sort of tickle a little against your forehead, right? And it's, there's something consoling about that. You actually feel like nature is touching you. He says, um, in our sight is ever changing, passing like a flash of lightning, can let us perceive. A starry sky, there he mentions it again. He's talking about the consolation, the exuberance of a starry sky as well. See, that's the thing I'd like to try to do. Just as by day I want to try to paint a green meadow spangled with starry dandelions. Right? And we've got a, a picture of that um, here. I think that's what he had in mind. So in a, in a way, what he's painting here is, is kind of like the universe. He's painting... Uh, you might see a field, but he's, he's painting kind of the cosmos. He's painting um, the Milky Way in, in, a, in a sense. He's trying to paint um, the exuberance of life and, and how nature is consoling. Do you get a sense of that? That's what he's trying to communicate. Yet, how can I do it unless I work it out at home from my imagination? Of course, this faults my idea while yours gets praised. At the moment, I'm absorbed in the blooming, <coughs> the blooming fruit trees, pink peach trees. 
yellow white pear trees. So he's painting peach trees, apricot trees, pear trees, apple trees. Have I missed anything? All sorts of fruit trees. And all, of course, all of these trees uh, make uh, you know colorful blossoms. He says, my brush stroke is no system at all. I hit the canvas with irregular touches of the brush, which I leave as they are. So there's a fascinating insight into his process. Patches of thickly laid on color, spots of canvas left uncovered. Yo, the portions that are left absolutely unfinished. Well, certainly his bullfighter picture is a bit like that. Repetitions, savageries. In short, I'm inclined to think that the result is so disquieting and irritating as to be a godsend to those people who have preconceived ideas about technique. For that matter, here is a sketch. The entrance to a provincial orchard with its yellow fences, its enclosure of black cypresses against the mistral. So there's another reference to the wind. It's characteristic vegetables of varying degrees, yellow lettuces, onions, garlic, emerald leeks. Working directly on the spot all the time, I try to grasp what is essential in the drawing. Later, I fill in the spaces which are bounded by contours, either expressed or not, but in any case felt, with tones which are also simplified. By which I mean that all that is going to be soil will share the same violet-like tone, that the whole sky will have a blue tint, that the green vegetation will either be green-blue or yellow-green, purposefully exaggerating the yellows and blues in this case. In short, my dear comrade, in no case, an eye-deceiving job. What does he mean by that? He doesn't want photographic deadness. Okay. As for visiting um, Marseille, Tang, Tangier, no fear of that. If notwithstanding this, I should go there. It would be in search of cheaper lodgings. Otherwise, so he's still looking for proper place to, to stay. Otherwise, I'm convinced that even if I were to work all my life, I should not be able to do one half of all that is characteristic of this town alone. So that's, that's quite a statement, quite a compliment to all. He says, if I had to work all my life, I wouldn't be able to do half of the um, characteristic scenes in all. Right? That's quite a compliment to all. Then he says, by the way, I've seen bullfights in the arena, or rather sham fights, seeing that the bulls were numerous, but there was nobody to fight them. However, the crowd is magnificent. So again, he seems to be more, and you can imagine if he's extremely lonely, he's more fussed about the people around him than the animals. He says, those great colorful multitudes piled up one above the other on two or three galleries with the effect of sun and shade and the shadow cast by the enormous ring. So it's quite interesting. He's, bear in mind, this is like, we are used to stadiums today. This is, you know, a hundred and something years ago. This is probably the first time he's had so many people around him. Remember, he's a country bumpkin. And, um, <clears throat> and um, it obviously made a huge impression. I wish you a good journey, a handshake in, sh in thought, your friend Vincent. Okay. How many letters have we got left? 11 April, 13 April, 21 April. Are oh, there quite a few? Not sure if I'm going to be able to get through all of them. Um, my glass is half full and my voice is feeling a bit ragged. Anyway, let's see what where we can get to. Um, so 11 April, uh, my dear Theo, it's awfully good to, of you to send me all the paints I ordered. I just received them, but I have not yet had time to check them. 
Um, I'm so glad you have them. The weather today has been fine. This morning I worked on an orchard of plum trees in bloom all at once. A fierce wind sprang up, an effect I had seen nowhere else but here. I can't overemphasize that. Um, remember I said in the previous episode, smoke inspired Monet. Well, the wind inspired Van Gogh. The, the wind made him realize that the landscape's alive, the sky, there's movement in the sky, there's movement in the trees. And what, what the wind does is create the sense that your environment is alive, almost like electricity. And that's exactly what you see in his art. And I don't think that is necessarily Van Gogh being a genius. It's simply Van Gogh being in a particular part of the world where that sensation is there and he simply recognized it. Thanks, Stephanie. Six to go. Uh, I think I'm going to skip through some parts of them. It says, the sun shone in between and all the little white flowers sparkled. It was so lovely. My friend the Dane came to join me and I went on painting at the risk and peril of seeing the whole show on the ground at any moment. So this idea that he's painting and the wind could actually blow his painting on into the dirt. He did actually do that once. By the way, they've, they've actually found grasshoppers in his paint. And even, I think, a, a seashell or, or, or dirt from a beach they found in his paint as well. Uh, he says, it's a white effect with a good deal of yellow in it and blue and lilac, the sky white and blue. What's that? Okay. It says, as to the execution of what one paints outside like this, what will people say? Well, we shall see. Then after dinner, I set to work on the same picture that Tierstig is to have, the Pont de Anglaise. And I have a good mind to make a replica of the one for Jet Mauve as well. I was sorry afterward not to have asked old Tangi for the paints all the same. Don't forget to say hello for me if you see him. It seems to me more and more that people are the root of everything. And though it will always be a melancholy thought that you yourself are not in real life. I mean, that it's more worthwhile to work in flesh and blood itself than in paint or plaster, more worthwhile to make children than pictures or carry on business. All the same, you feel like you're alive when you remember that you have friends who are outside real life as much as you. But just because it's what people have in their hearts that matters and it is at the heart of all business dealings too, we must make friendships in Holland or rather revive them. More especially since, as far as the Impressionist cause is concerned, another reference to that, there's little fear now that we shall not win. And because of the victory all already almost assured, we must have good manners and do everything quietly. Let's see if we can have a quick look at Marat's incarnation. I think it's this. I'm not 100% sure what... Is it this? Not quite sure if that's what it's referring to. Anyway. Uh, anyway, then he talks about as Le Trick finished his picture of the woman leaning on her elbows on a little table in a cafe. If I can manage to learn to work our studies from nature on a fresh canvas, we should profit by it. Do you remember when before Van Gogh went to Paris, where he was insisting, I must have models, I must have models, I must have models. You know, I only want to paint from models. He's not really doing that anymore. Do, do, do you remember that? That he was totally fixated on models. And, and the only thing I want to do is that. And where he is now, he's not doing that anymore. Quite interesting. OK. 
Okay. Right. Um, so I'm going to just go through, go to on to the next letter. These are fairly short, looks like. My dear Theo, thank you for your letter and the samples of absorbent canvas. I shall be very glad to have it. But there's no hurry at all. Three meters of the stuff at six francs. Talks about the tubes, Prussian blue. Uh, here's a blossoming pear tree. You can see it's done in, uh, can you see how it's outlined? It's done in kind of a Japanese style. He's still finding his way. I must tell you that I'm working at two pictures of which I want to make copies. The pink peach tree gives me the most trouble. You see from the three squares on the other side of this page that the three orchards make a series, more or less. I've also just now a little pear tree vertical between two horizontal canvases. I should like very much to do the series of nine canvases. Um, anyway, it talks about the little pear tree has a violet trunk and white flowers with a big yellow butterfly on one of the clusters. To the left in the corner, a little garden with a fence of yellow reeds and green bushes and a flower bed, a little pink house. Let's see if we can find the big yellow butterfly. Oh, is that, that's it over there. Not terribly well executed. Where's the pink house? I don't see a pink house. But the last three pictures exist only provisionally. They should represent a very big orchard surrounded by cypresses and great pear trees and apple trees. The ponder anglaise for you is coming along well and will be better than the study, I think. I'm very anxious to get back to work as the gula me. Surely it would be a good bargain if it's possible to buy it, only since they're talking of a new method of fixing pastels. He says, I have a letter from Bernard with some sonnets he has concocted and some of them really come off quite well. He'll manage to write a good sonnet yet. I think I could very nearly envy him. Okay. From Vincent van Gogh to Emile Bernard, uh, 21st of April. My dear comrade, many thanks for the sonnets. Beneath the sleeping domes of the gigantic trees. However, with regard to the idea and sentiment, it may be that I prefer the last one. For hope has poured into my breast its neurosis. That's what he's been painting. That's that's quite, uh, I quite like that. Not sure if I like the blue branches here. But um, that's one of the better ones, I think. You know, if you want to contrast the blossoms, you need to have not that color over here. Anyway. It says, it seems to me that you do not clearly, you do not say clearly enough what you want to make felt. The certainty that one seems to have and which one can in any case prove of the nothingness, the emptiness, the betrayal of the desirable good and beautiful things. And that despite this knowledge, one lets oneself be eternally fooled by the charm which eternal life, the things outside ourselves, exercises on our six senses, as if one did not know anything, and especially not the difference between objectivity and subjectivity. Fortunately for us, we remain stupid and hopeful in this way. Quite deep, um, uh, qu quite deep thoughts that he's sharing there. Cornerwich Chapel. Um, should we have a look at Albre Albrecht Dürer's art? See if we can just get a sense of that.
not really my cup of tea. Uh, that sort of thing. Anyway, that's what he's referring to. And then he says, uh, talks about this twisted on his spiral cross, seems kind of poetic writing. Um, He says, here is another orchard, rather simple as a composition. Yesterday I overdid one canvas of a cherry tree against a blue sky. The young leaf shoots were orange and gold, the clusters of flower were white, and that against the green blue of the sky was wonderfully glorious. Unfortunately, there's rain today, which prevents my returning to the charge. Yeah, you have some insight into what he's doing, that he doesn't seem to tell his brother. Uh, he says, I... Saw a brothel here last Sunday, not counting the other days, a large room, the walls covered with blued whitewash, like a village school. Fifty or more military men in red, in red and civilians in black, their faces a magnificent yellow or orange. The woman in sky blue in vermilion, as unqualified and garish as possible. The whole in a yellow light, a good deal less gloomy than the same kind of offices in Paris. Don't you get a sense that that if he's so familiar with Bernard that he can talk about brothels and whatever and military men, bear in mind Bernard's joining the military, that he must have visited brothels with Bernard, right? Did you get that idea? In Paris, there's no spleen in the air here. What does he mean by that? There's no weariness of life coupled with eccentric behavior. So I think he, what he means is in, in Paris, people would uh, deal with the, the wear and tear of life in the city, the hustle and bustle, the pollution, the, the clamor by kind of just behaving eccentrically, um, behaving in a silly way, you know, I think that's what he's getting at. For the moment, I'm still lying low and keeping very quiet. First of all, I must recover from a stomach disorder. You kind of get the idea that he's saying I'm not partying very hard because I'm not feeling that great. Uh, a little bit of humor there. I'm the happy owner of a stomach disorder. So he doesn't have bipolar disorder. He has a stomach disorder. And he's a little lonely. He says, after that, I shall have to make a lot of noise. And then he refers to, you know, he wants to um, have a similar story like Tartar and the Tarasson. It's a fictional, we, we dealt with that in a previous episode. I was enormously interested to hear that you intend to spend your time as a soldier in Algeria. That's perfect and quite far from being a misfortune. Really, I congratulate you on it. At any rate, we shall see each other in Marseille. You will see how delighted you'll be with seeing the blue here and with feeling the sun. At So I think if he's going to Algeria, he expects Bernard to pass through and that he might get a visit. I certainly intend to do seascapes at Marseille too. I don't yearn for the gray sea of the north. If you see Gorgar, remember me most kindly to him. I must write to him right now. My dear comrade Bernard, don't despair, and above all, don't have spleen, old fellow, for with your talent and with your stay in Algeria, you will turn out a wonderfully good and true artist. You too will belong to the South. If I have any advice to give you, it is to fortify yourself to eat healthy things. Well, that's advice he could do with as well. Um, a full year in advance from now, for it won't do to come here with a damaged stomach and deteriorated blood. This was the case with me, and although I'm recovering, so he's saying, don't do what I did. Don't come here with a damaged stomach. Uh, he says, I'm recovering. I'm recovering slowly, and I regret not having been a bit more careful beforehand, but not such a damnable winter as the past, uh, past one. What was there to be done? For it was a superhuman winter. So get your blood in good condition in advance. 
So another thing that I think is worth mentioning is that Van Gogh's spirits, his motivation, his um, his uh, attitude sh suffers in winter. I think that's true of most of us. His um, ability to cope with everything dives uh, is is um, is is. Um, is weakened in winter. And so if he's going to take his own life, why wouldn't he do it in winter? When he's cold, when he can't paint, when he's reminded of his situation because it's too cold to go out or whatever. Right, so why, why did he die in the middle of summer, in the height of summer, in the middle of this incredible output, in the middle of going out every single day? Anyway, he says, um, it is difficult to pull through, but once one is in good health again, it is less difficult to remain so than in Paris. Write to me soon, always the same address. So he's still not at the Yellow House. And and the Yellow House, I think, comes up as an idea where, where he's, he's partially thinking, how do I deal with this loneliness? I need I need to bring someone here. I need a I need a companion. And we'll see when that comes up. Okay, so we now go to the uh, a letter to John Russell. I don't know if we're going to read too much of it. My dear Russell, I think my dog's dreaming. I ought to have answered your letter ever so long ago, but working pretty hard every day at night, I feel so often too weary to write. As it rains today, I avail myself of the opportunity. Last night, I have met McKnight and a Danish painter, and I intend to go see him at Von Viel next Monday. I feel sure I prefer him as an artist to what he is as an art critic. His views as such being so narrow that they make me smile. I hardly hope for you that you'll be able to leave Paris for good soon, and no doubt leaving Paris will do you a world of good in all respects. As for me, I remain enraptured with the scenery here. I am working at a series of blooming orchards. So, you know, he, he doesn't say anything about being lonely. He says, I'm caught up by the scenery. But he is feeling lonely, he just doesn't let on that he is. And involuntarily, I thought often of you because you did the same in Sicily. I wished you would one day, for another reason, when I shall set. I wish you would one day or another when I shall send over some work to Paris, exchange a Sicilian study with me in case you should have one to spare. You know, I thought and think such a great deal of those of yours. I don't gain say that your portraits are much are, are more serious and higher art. Okay, I'm going to skip through that. He says, I've heard nothing of our friend Mr. Reed. I felt rather anxious on his account because I feel sure he was on a false track. My brother has received a letter from him, but pretty unsatisfactory. He talks about being prompted to act in his crisis of nerves to make money, whilst painters would make pictures. So much to say that I consider the dealer stronger in him than the artist though there be a battle in his conscience concerning this. I feel bound to warn you with the same sympathy, however, for him, because I found him artistic in pleading the Monticelli cause. I'm going to jump through this. He says, talks about rich color and rich sun of the glorious South in a true colorist way parallel with Delacroix conception of the South, that the South be represented now by contrast. Anyway, um, I hope to hear from you soon. Can you see he's trying to develop relationships with um, with dealers and, and sort of form a network with other artists? There's a sketch of have you seen that building before? So if you look at that building, right, 
you, you see it over here see that that is the same as that right um okay dear theo thank you for your letter of today and for the 110 franc note it contained as for the earlier letter with the 50 francs i got it too and i wrote to you about it the day or two days before i sent the two drawings these drawings were made with a reed sharpened the way you would a goose quill a little bit of um detail regarding exactly what is using i intend to make a series of them and hope to do better uh, better ones in the first two it is a method that i had already tried in holland some time ago but i hadn't such good reads there as here is orchard with plum trees is I'm trying to see if there's a building in the background there can't quite see okay i i've had a letter from quinn please thank him for it i shall be very pleased to exchange the two drawings for one of his studies this is important news your journey to brussels you will be able to judge how the old high price stuff is going there but what a business well probably these fellows are planning some move do you remember that we talked about it before i left and said that in expectation of the universal exhibition um Bougarou, i'm not sure if that's a reference to the world fair not not quite sure or is it something else? I guess it's the uh, an ex exhibition of this particular artist. It talks about remaining true and faithful to the principles of that art, which is in truth the most civilized and most attractive, that is to say, their own pictures. Whatever it may be, it was pretty disquieting, and the situation would become serious if you quarreled with these gentlemen. I don't disguise from you that it will be a pretty severe blow to you, not at the moment, but say six months later, because of the change in your way of life that it would bring about. I don't know whether he's, I'm not quite sure what he's referring to here. I don't know if he's referring to Joe. I'm not quite sure what that's in reference to. Not quite sure what he's talking about. When a man comes out of a prison after having been there a long time, there will be moments when he will even miss his prison because he finds himself at a loss now that he is at liberty, so-called, I suppose. Because the grinding daily task of earning your living hardly leaves any liberty at all. But you know all this. You will certainly regret some things in spite of yourself, even while you are gaining others. What do you think he's talking about there? I do think the reason Van Gogh is struggling with loneliness more than ever is because he's come from... Paris. He's come from a situation where he was staying with his brother. Probably he took that for granted. And he had actually quite a few friends in Paris. He even had kind of a girlfriend in Paris. And now, just like that, he's completely kind of on his own. I think that was quite a shock. Tani says, by the way, Tani, Tani's reading the murder of Vincent van Gogh right now. Um, what, what do you, what's your favorite chapter so far? And how far are you from the end? Do you know? Uh, no, it wasn't Bernard. It was... Um, on Andres, uh, Joe's brother. Okay, then he says, um, 
Therefore, these orchards with the Ponda Anglis would constitute a first series. Here is a sketch of an orchard that I plan more particularly for you to celebrate May 1st. It's absolutely clear and done all in one go. A frenzy of impastos of the faintest yellow and lilac on the original white mass. You will probably be in Holland by then and perhaps you will be seeing the same trees in flower there on that very day. So bear in mind, spring comes earlier in the south of France and then it moves gradually north as the weather warms. But indeed, it will do you good to have breakfast. I do it here myself and eat two eggs every morning. So yes, yes, some insight into his daily life. I have two eggs every morning. My stomach is very weak, but I hope to be able to get it right. So he's, he's aware that his health is um, not great. He's aware of it. It will take time and patience. In any case, I'm really much better already than in Paris. Besides, one doesn't really seem to need a great deal of food here. And so, you know, he, he is still going without to some extent, right? While I think of it, I want to tell you that more and more I doubt the truth of the legend of Monticelli drinking such enormous quantities of absinthe. He's not saying that for nothing because he's also drinking absinthe. When I look at his work, I can't think it possible that a man who was flabby with drink could have done that. Perhaps that Limoges woman, the uh, La Roque female, set her evil tongue wagging, and so the legend took, took root. I'm writing in haste so that you will get my letter before you leave, if it is the Sunday that you intend to start. Although I do not think that the journey will be very delight delightful if Der Lord and Co's pictures are to be the bulk of the collection designed for the worthy Belgians, all the same, I wish you a good time and a good journey, and above all, be of good heart. I saw Bernard still alive unfinished and thought it magnificent. A handshake for you. Twenty fourth April. I think there's one letter after that. Uh, this is the last letter. So this is the last letter in April, and then then we're going to conclude this episode. Tani says, I'm 60% done. Uh, are you finding it a, a good narrative? Are you, are you learning anything? Are you, do you have any criticisms? By the way, if you, if you guys are interested in the book, The Murder of Vincent van Gogh, I'll put a link. I'll put a link in, uh, in chat. It's available on Kindle and in a paperback. Okay, last letter. My dear Thea, I must begin by telling you that the letter you did not get was wrongly addressed by me and so came back. In a moment of absent-mindedness, just like me, I addressed it to Rue de Laval instead of Rue Lepic. I've actually been to Rulepic. It's like a blue door in um, the Montmartre area. Robbie, Robin, that is that is. I'm um, I'm hurt to 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 see that. I have the book. I just need to get reading it. Have you started reading it? Have you read the first paragraph? Have you read the first sentence? Tani says, "Wonderful." What? Uh, what has stood out to you so far? Then he says, that being so, I will uh, I will repeat what is in the letter as though it just happened. The visit of McKnight, Russell's friend, who also came again last Sunday. I am to go to see him and his work, of which I have so far seen nothing. He's a Yankee. Here you, here you go, guys. There's an American... Visit, so his name is McKnight, and he's visiting Van Gogh, or Van Gogh's visiting him. And he says, he probably paints much better than most Yankees do, but a Yankee all the same. <laughs> Have I said enough? 
when I have seen his pictures or drawings, I'll tell you what I think of his work. Meantime, so much for the man. The chief object of this letter is to find out if you have started and how, and afterward, oh, this afterward, perhaps you will hardly know yourself. Well, it seems that these Boussard Valadon people still don't give two straws for the judgment of the artists themselves. Josie, have you read it as well? That's interesting. Robbie says, I'll crack on. That's good, good to hear. If you do, please take some notes and then share them with us, things that stood out to you, especially the section dealing with all and Goga and the interpretation of the colors and the symbolism of the colors and all that kind of thing. He says, you see, I daren't go on in a line of things which are going to cost you more than they will bring in at present. For all these discussions with the BV, people are rather an indication that Impressionism hasn't taken on enough. You see how, how before Paris, he hardly ever mentions Impressionism. After Paris, it's in almost every single letter. I'm shocked that Yvonne hasn't finished the paperback. I'm shocked. Tanny says, the symbolism of the colors. I, I thought that was quite a strong uh, aspect to my analysis. I thought that was done quite well. Okay. Stephanie says, I just reread that part yesterday. Cool. I stopped painting at once and went on with a series of pen drawings of which you had the first two, but this time they're small in size. Well, I said to myself that a quarrel with these people would mean that you must have few expenses on my account. Not being so keen as all that on my pictures, I could leave them alone without repining over much. Happily for me, I'm not the sort of fellow who cares for nothing in the world but pictures. On the contrary, since I believe it's possible to produce a work of art at less cost than one must spend on a painting, I've begun the series of pen and ink drawings. Meanwhile, I have some vexations, that's another way of saying concerns, and I don't think I can get rid of them as long as I stay where I am. So he's talking about I need a better, better accommodation. I would rather take a room or, or if needs be two rooms, one for sleeping, one for work. For the people here are trying to take advantage of me so as to make me pay high for everything on the pretext that I take up a little more room with my pictures than the other clients who are not painters. So there's a little bit of enmity going on. There's a little bit of um, disagreement between him and the folks running the Airbnb, right? Um, there's a bit of an anachronism for you. Um, anyway, he says, on my side, I shall make the most of the fact that I stay longer and spend more in the inn than the workmen who come and go. And they won't find it easy to get so much as a cent out of me. But it's a perpetual nuisance to have to drag all one's apparatus and one's pictures after one and make it harder both to go out and to come in. As I must make a move in any case, would you like it or rather would it suit you better if I went to Marseille now? So things are have deteriorated so quickly barely two months into his stay that he's actually considering going to marseille and i don't know whether he wants to go to marseille on the off chance that he might bump into bernard when he goes through there on his way to algiers i don't know if that's what he's thinking about anyway he says i could do a series of marines there like the series of orchards in bloom here also, I've bought three strong linen shirts and two pairs of stout shoes with the idea of moving. Well, he's not going to end up moving out of all. At Marseille, I'd make it more especially my business to get hold of a window to show the Impressionist if you on your side could promise that you would provide me with Impressionist pictures. Do you see how many references there are to that? 
Supposing you were asked to show any, that'll be easy enough. Sometimes I'm seriously afraid that both you and I are going to be swindled by this crew with all the annoyance they're giving us, but I'm finding it out. Don't let them swindle you. That's enough for today. Let me know your address if you go anywhere. When will you be in Holland? The same address for me, but I should like to move for I'm not comfortable. I'll, so it's from this point that he starts scouting out for what would become the famous yellow house, right? I'll send you pen drawings in a little while. I've done four already with a handshake. I shall be very hard up by the end of the month, but I'll manage. It's just that I should be like to be able to clear out at once. That's worrying me. Now, I've said this before. One of the reasons given for why Van Gogh took his life is that he didn't want to be a burden to his brother. He felt that he was going to be, because his brother had just gotten married and because his brother had a child, a newborn, he felt like, I'm, I don't want to be a burden to my brother, so I'm going to, you know what. And he's, he's been a burden to his brother for years. And he becomes more of a burden to his brother over time. He, he, he wants more canvases. Um, he orders more colors. And so if you, you don't understand the story and you don't understand the context, if you don't, you're not familiar with that, then, then that's going to make sense to you. Oh, now I can see he, he was kind of um, just like sacrificing himself to protect Theo. Bullshit. He's been a burden to his brother all along. And his brother, although it's not really mentioned much in the letters, his brother ends up inheriting his share of his father's of what his father leaves him. So, so it's not strictly speaking Theo giving Vincent money. It's Theo being a guardian in a way of his own inheritance. Yeah. Yeah, I must say, uh, I, I don't quite know how that happened. Um, I've... Um, done quite a few books that have been formatted. And for some reason, you write that the text in the print version of this book is small. And um, yeah, it's just, it's a kind of a, it's a painful thing to think about because um, I worked so hard on this book and now I kind of do need to go back to the book uh, probably I'd need to do an audio version of it. Uh, maybe w when I've concluded the Van Gogh letters, I'll do the audio book version of it. And, um, and then, and then uh, republish it in the proper format, but it definitely is um, not, not helpful. Definitely is not helpful. Yeah. It does have small text. I used to say to everyone, rather buy the Kindle version, and then they buy the paperback version and complain that the text is too small. But I mean, I feel the same way. I, you know, you want text to be a certain size, is, there, is, is on the small side. By the way, the shirt that I'm wearing uh, was given to me by a girlfriend I had who was a lawyer who lived in Singapore. I don't really wear the shirt very often, but um, yeah. So on a different subject, um, I'm in kind of a good mood today because, um, you know, the, the whole premise of this channel, Team Peachtree, is that you can grow in the shade and ultimately, um, you know, if you stick to your, your guns and you believe in yourself, then you can, you know, you can achieve something. And as those of you who know me know, um, the last 
year, so almost pretty much the whole of 2022, was uh, quite a difficult year for quite a few reasons. Um, my other channel just totally went nowhere, kind of just stayed on. I was at about 85,000 subscribers in January, February, and it stayed at that level till basically December. And then I think on the, based on the Kylie Rodney case and to some extent the um, Idaho case, it suddenly just you know shot up after that. Um, but what I'm talking about is you are uh, working, you're doing, you're doing, you know, you're working every day and your channel's just not growing. Meanwhile, another channel is just flying, like growing like this. And, and then you say, you can, you can sort of fold your arms and be bitter and say, all of that growth is at my expense, right? And of course, what you need to do as the tree growing in the shade is say, not like look at the other tree and say, well, I'm jealous that you're getting so much sunshine or it's not fair or this or that. You, you've got to say, well, what can I do? Like, what can I do? Not not what, what am I losing or who's to blame? And so one of the things I did do was, uh, even though I was earning a lot less, I spent $10,000 that's not any exaggeration, $10,000 on a solar system just to keep the lights on. So one of the things that was holding me back in terms of being able to work was you're in the middle of typing out a script and the power goes out. You're in the middle of doing a live and the power goes out. And of course, this other channel didn't have any of those problems. And so, as I say, you can cry and moan that life's unfair, or you can be in that place in the shade and, and, and think about getting, finding a way back to the sunshine, right? And um, as I say, this channel uh, grew phenomenally quickly. And I think at one stage, shot by my channel with like 20,000 subscribers, right? Uh, caught up to mine and shot by mine, and it was like fifteen to twenty thousand subscribers ahead. And uh, my channel is now past hers, right? I think you know who I'm talking about. And um, I think what you can say besides the the team peach tree or the peach tree promise, which is um, if, even if you're in the shade, um, you know push your roots further into the ground, uh, res uh, get that resolve, you know, you know, like um, be resolved uh, and, and resolute in what you know you need to do. Um, and um, yeah, focus on what what is part of your, what you have power over, not what you don't have power over. And um, yeah, and so in terms of that, it's quite a quite a good feeling to have found my way, certainly in terms of just that example, into the sunshine, so to speak. And I was thinking before I came onto this live, I was thinking, is there another example of of that? And and and, I, and it's a question I want to ask you guys as well. Is it is an example where you are finding yourself in the shade? Think about Van Gogh as well. Someone who painted paintings his whole life. And artists around him sold their work, but he had to still have confidence in what he was doing, even though there was no outward um, validation of, of all that effort. I mean, you can't say that he wasn't a hard worker. You can't say that he was deluded. You can't say that he was an idiot. He, he knew what he was doing. He did need to um, improve his craft, certainly, but you can't accuse him of laziness and you know ultimately his work did find its way into the brightest sunlight that there is in terms of the art world unfortunately after he died right 
And so can you think of something like that in your life where you feel like you're in the shade and you need to uh, find your way to the light? I can think of one as well. I, I can think of one. Um, my my brother is a is a pretty good athlete. He's just done the August in Cape Town, the world's biggest one day cycle race. Uh, he's in pretty good shape, pretty fit. I used to be a, a really good triathlete. I used to be, uh, you know, did the Ironman. I did quite a few half Ironmans. He's done quite a few as well. But um, in my day, I was, I was, I think, better than what he was. I know at one point I was sixth in South Africa in my age group. And at the moment, he's totally outclasses me in that respect. And I sort of feel like in that respect, in terms of fitness and as a sports person, I'm definitely still, I'm, I'm in, I'm in the shade. I can, when we swim together, I can, I can sometimes um, out, out swim him like, like right now. Um, but I'm definitely not, I'm definitely in the shade in, a, in another sense. And so I think it's worth thinking about um, in that affirmative Team Peachtree um, allegory, where you say, I need, I want to be better vis-a-vis -vis either someone else or something else. And so how are you going to do that? Well, you're not going to do it by blaming anyone. You're not going to do that by um, despairing. You've got to find your way to that success first by resolving what you what you are going to do right and so that is so true you first got to validate yourself and say you know i believe i'm worth more than this or i believe i can achieve more than this or whatever it is josie says i think he's a great writer as well as a painter but i mean it all comes down to self-belief at the end of the day Right, and if you've got that self-belief, then you've got that self-motivation. And I think what the tremendous lesson there is in Van Gogh is that: Do you need to sell? I'm talking about like in terms of his art. If you don't ever sell a painting, that, does that mean you should stop? In other words, if there's never an outward sign from the world that you're successful, that you what you're doing means anything, should you then stop? And I think that's the ultimate in the tree that's in the shade that is growing towards the sun in the hope that he will find it. It doesn't in a way matter whether you find the sun or not. What matters is that that hope is authentic, um, that it's real, that, 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 that is part of your identity. Do you know what I'm saying? Because what other choice do you have at the end of the day? What must the tree do? Just sort of go, life's too tough. I'm going to shrivel up. All that you can really do is grow. But you need to grow authentically. You need to grow based on your own life, your own identity, your own circumstances, your own roots, your own soil. That's what you must focus on. The moment you start looking at someone else, no matter how easy it is or how unfair it is or how wrong it is or how ridiculous it is, none of that's really going to help you. Uh, thanks a lot. So that is what you've got to do at the end of the day. You've got to know who you are and stay true to who you are. And the worst thing you can do is look at what someone else is doing and then copy them to just almost say, oh, you a success formula. I'm going to do exactly what you're doing. That's the worst thing you can do. You can be influenced by, how can I put it? So in the same way Van Gogh saw the impressionists and, and he said, okay, so color is, color is an important part of what needs to be expressed and communicated. You can take some insight from your environment, right? Um, in the same way that, you know, I've, I've definitely 
um, upgraded my game. I mean, I, I think you would agree that a certain amount of competition has made my 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 product better. You know, you might say as someone who, who joined my channel two or three years ago, that, that what it was then and what it is now has definitely improved. And I would agree with you. I would say some of the technology, if, if I look around myself and I look at the soundproofing, um, the equipment that I bought and so on, um, yeah, that definitely has been upgraded. But you can only take that so far where you invest in equipment and so on. At the end of the day, it's uh, how do you grow? How do you improve as a person, right? Calgo says cultivate non-comparison. And you've got to be careful with that because Van Gogh, in a way, lived in his own little echo chamber before he went to Paris. So he was going nowhere fast during that period, do you, do you follow? Before he went to Paris, he was like in his own little echo chamber. I know for a fact that these um, feces colored potato eaters, that is uh, awesome. And then he goes to Paris and he realizes, well, there's this whole world of color out there. So, you know, you also need some exposure and to be self-critical and to think critically and say, okay, let's be realistic here. But but also not get caught up that who you are is based on yourself compared to someone else. You want to know who you are based on knowing your environment and also knowing where you fit into that environment. One thing that was a bit of a, yeah, I think I would call it an existential crisis for me, and to some extent still is, was this, this realization that, I don't know what you guys will say about this, but was the realization that the majority of the true crime community don't want or care about authenticity. Now, you say, I'm the most authentic voice in true crime. You kind of realize, yeah, but people don't want anything they don't really care about that if, if they're being honest what they care about is i want to hear the story that i want to hear the way i want to hear it i'm saying the majority don't i'm saying you can look at some huge channels that aren't based on telling the truth they're based on um sensationalism shock value etc etc channels twice the size of mine right and that is where you've got to be careful and say, well, what what do you stand for? What are your values? And are you going to give them up just to be popular? And that's that's the, the, the thing that Van Gogh stood for, is he said, if I'm not popular, if I don't sell a single artwork, that's okay, because I'm telling this story, I'm doing this. And I think um, that's pretty incredible. To be honest, I personally don't feel like if you never ever sell anything and you're not successful, um, I don't consider that like heroic. You know what I mean? If I'd written a hundred books and not sold a single one, I, I wouldn't consider that a success. I think it is important that you that you find out what your audience wants and to some extent cater to them, but also hold on to what you want to say, um, even when it's unpopular, especially when it's unpopular. Yvonne says, um, sometimes one must also just wait till the time is right for change. Some things can't be forced. Yeah, I think one of the things I did during my slump was I I focused a little bit on audiobooks, and um, I wouldn't actually mind getting back to that. I've transcribed 20 out of 100 books from the written book to the audiobook, and the Van Gogh is one that I really need to do. Um, so whenever there's a slump, and I'm sure there will be, I would be happy to get back into audiobooks. 
Um, yeah. Yeah, knowing where you came from. Robbie says, I love the potato eaters. That would be music to his ears, I think. But I'm I'm so glad he went from the potato, he, he went beyond the potato eaters. Can you imagine if he stayed in the potato eater style? If he never graduated beyond that, we would never have Starry Night or Wheat Filled with Crows. Yeah, so I must say, um, just my personal feeling is um, when you can have the lights on, uh, you know, 24 hours a day, and when you don't have someone scooping you, you know, like coming out, you know, because it's not just that, it's not just scooping you, someone puts out a story, and then you've got to counter it in your in your analysis, because people say, that's not what I heard, it's this or that, then you kind of got like a, a counter narrative that you've got to deal with. And what is quite refreshing to deal with in the last couple of weeks was being able to just tell a story without anyone else um, telling another story and, and being able to tell it on my own timeline and, and at my own pace and so on and shows you what happens when that's, when, when that's the case. It kind of makes me feel like in future when this particular channel does a particular story, I'm going to deliberately not do the same story um, because it ends up being um, like uh, that's what you say and, and I just don't like that. I'd rather just do a completely different case and surely there are enough high profile cases where you can do that. So if, if a high profile case comes along and that channel covers that, I think I'm going to deliberately just not cover it because it's like running on a treadmill. Um, you know, it, it does literally um, carve your effort to some extent. And maybe there'll be a couple of cases we'll both cover at the same time, but more and more I, I see, oh, you're covering that, I won't cover it. Um, and I hope... I hope um, it's going to be reciprocal. I'd, I'd appreciate the same thing, uh, you know, from the other side. But I'm sure there'll be a very high-profile case that one covers, everyone covers, or whatever, um, like a Gabby Petito type thing. But yeah. Uh, Magical Mother says, "I've no clue who you're talking about." Well, that's okay. You don't have to know. Um, I'm also grateful to have Solar. You're going to make a movie about the murder of Vincent van Gogh. Not quite sure. Uh, Stephanie says, I miss the audiobooks. Yeah, I must say, what is so great about the audiobooks is you, you going through a book that you've written and then sometimes in the re in real time um, that case comes up and you can deal with that deep analysis that that the book goes into you can kind of touch on that in a way that's just incredibly rich um, so that's the one thing the other one is intertextually you can often uh, mention things um, to be honest my original plan was to do Amanda Knox. I was really going to, I really wanted to cover Amanda Knox. And then these huge high profile cases just blew all of those plans uh, apart. Um, if you guys remember, I was actually narrating Despicable. And, and, and unlike me, I got halfway through and then, uh, you know, other things took over. I actually had three. I've already written a script out at three Amanda Knox, um, what do you call it? Um, yeah, scripts that I was going to deal with in depth. And then, um, yeah, I just never got 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 to, 
to um, got to them. Um, the Amanda Knox case is extremely tricky because you've got a young person who can answer back. And, you know, it's a little bit different to the Madeleine McCann case where they have stepped out of the media thing. Amanda Knox is very actively part of the conversation. In fact, she's part of the true crime conversation. So, um, yeah, it's definitely tricky and, and kind of a challenge. Oh, making Bloodline into a movie. So by the way, um, yeah, I mean, that is my, that, that would be a dream come true, making this into a movie. Um, and that's something we can also do maybe later this week is, would you guys like to listen to Bloodline, um, another read through of a couple of chapters? Um, I want to also do the Pigafetta Chronicles, um, like, five episodes, something like that, five episodes dealing with some of these letters. Alina says, let's continue Bloodline Book Club. Okay. Do you guys want me to read a quick chapter from, from Bloodline? What do you guys say? Okay. So I'm going to read chapter six. It's um, 32, 33, basically two pages. Let me just see if I can uh, find bloodline, the PDF here. I think it's somewhere, somewhere here. Then you guys can read with me. I think it's this. And that's just a cover. That's that's one of the covers of Bloodline. Um, but let's go to the other thing. So we're going to go to chapter six, the reawakening. Okay, let's do that. Okay, a little bit of a bonus for you guys who are still sticking around. Uh, okay, shall I read from here or from there? I think I'm going to read from, from the paperback. Even though it is day, it is dark, I use a small blade to sharpen my pencils. The handle is missing and the cold plays tricks on my fingers, making the small piece of sharp metal difficult to hold on to. When I nick my finger for the hundredth time, the blood makes the blade even more greasy. My fingers are so slick with it, I nick myself again and again. I put the blade on a battered wooden table. I glance outside, a light snow has begun, a distant thunder rumbles. And there's another sound, deeper and more troubling. It is the far off groaning of ice, gnawing the sides of mountains as they make their way inexorably here. 
I shudder, I stare into a lazy candle flame. I enjoy the scant warmth spooling off the twig of the wick. Then comes the wind, the flame shivers. I try to protect it, but another savage blast extinguishes it. The orange star top the blackened cotton fades to nothing. So that's obviously a, a reference to, you know, when you blow out a candle, that last little bit of glowing from the wick kind of eventually uh, disappears. And so it's obviously taking a microscopic look at the life of this person in this castle, how, how you notice the extinguishing of a bit of warmth, how the spark that is part of life on earth is going out. Okay, maybe I should just read it from what you guys can see. Um, I glance over my shoulder. Still, she sleeps in my bed. She has slept for many days now, and I've gathered little from her so far. My master tells us she has made a long journey over land and seascapes trapped in the grip of ice. Before she slept, she murmured something about her youngest younger brother. She said he'd acted as her guide for much of the way, but died just half a day's walk from here. Would I go out and retrieve his body? So that's what she's asked him to do. Most of us here have lost the appetite for funerals and funeral rites. For a long time, that is all we seem to be doing. And yet it is blindingly obvious that our reason for being here is something else. We do not exist for the sole purpose of burying our brothers and being buried ourselves, certainly not I. Yet through the agitated flakes and the detritus of past civilizations that we've undoubtedly become, we do little else. I do little else. <laughs> Today, which will be the 14th day of her rest, I notice a few wood coals stewing among, amongst the ashes. Since she stirs behind me, I order my man Udak, a fellow of uncommon uncommon metal to go out and retrieve her kin. So she kind of asks him, can you go and get my brother's body? And so instead of him doing it, he asks his, um, his uh, it's not his slave, but basically his sort of servant, right? And so you can also get a sense that, that the scrivener must be a person He's not the lowest of the low. He's got his own sort of servant working for him, right? Anyway, he says, there are few here able to follow snow tracks like he can. My friend Rata is good, but only half as good. Despite ferocious winds and appalling weather, Udok goes out alone. He follows her trail to the place where she lost her brother. Upon his return, Udok tells me a great brown mark remains in the snow where your young brother bled out. Hundreds of paw prints litter the scene where wolves tore at his remains. He returns at the close of day with a sock and nothing else. He hands me the sock. He wasn't, he says, able to retrieve anything else. Not even a weapon. Udak shakes his head. I tell Udak to take his axe, go out and bring a load of wood to my room. At one point, she wakes briefly and asks me about her brother. I give her the sock. <clears throat> she presses it to her mouth, pulls it to her chest, and closes her eyes. Four more days, she sleeps. So can you see the um, portrait that is being sketched is, is incredibly despairing. Like, how, how can you have hope in a place of such brutality and so much uh, hardship, right? And she's trying to convalesce. She's trying to kind of come alive again. She's trying to regain her strength. Meanwhile, there's this uh, attrition, this relentless attrition going on. Um, even even just trying to get her brother's body back, all, all she ends up getting back is a sock, right? And how do you live in a world like that? How do you um, develop some sense of um, agency in a world as terrifying as this? Four more piles of wood are delivered. My friend Rata brings a fifth bundle. 
We sit quietly talking by the candle, drinking drams. He teaches me Spanish. He tells me stories about his kin. Remember, Rata is the last Spanish person in the world. And the history he can remember, I listen. Some of it I write down. When the storm finally passes and she still sleeps, I begin to ache for my own bed. I begin to wonder whether my charge is dying. So when I enter the room and find her not just awake, but sitting on my chair on the edge of the fire's golden glow, I'm not only surprised, but pleased. A fish of excitement jumps in my stomach. Flames hiss, crackle and shoot. I see she has already burned through two piles of precious wood, but I say nothing about this. The hearth roars. Hearth roars. Nevertheless, it pains me that while she has sat here alone, warming herself, I have been occupied elsewhere, flirting with frostbite. The tips of my fingers still burn with cold pain. Hello, I say. She scowls at me, jumps up, brandishes my chair at me. Despite the fire, she's trembling with cold. For some minutes, we shout at each other in different languages. Then, both of us overcome with weariness, I retire to my chair and turn my back on her, while she turns her back on the fire and stares at me, a small stone clutched in her hand in case I make any move. Much later, she falls asleep on the chair. With the fire dying behind her, I worry she may die of cold, and then it may be my head. I stand, cross the room like a shadow, and place a large cloak made of wolf fur, one Udok made for me, over her slim shoulders. This one cloak is made from the coats of five animals stitched together. It's my most prized possession. Dunker, she says, but she's half asleep. She's talking to her brother, half dreaming, half smiling. I'm Richard, I say slowly. She erupts out of the chair and smashes my face with her fists. And then that's the end of the chapter. So it's difficult to make friends in this environment. Who do you trust? And so that's the that's where we are. Yeah, so at last she's woken up. So we, we'll see what happens next. I think part of the answer to how do you deal with such unbearable, unfathomable difficulty is, well, if you can find love, that, that might help. Um, you know, how do you push that amount of terrible cold and horror to one side? Well, the joy of fellowship with, with somebody else, that's one way. Deb Palm says, I'm afraid to read... <coughs> I'm afraid to read it, but I would like to hear more. Okay. Okay, guys, I hope you found that worthwhile. Um, bear in mind, in terms of the Van Gogh letters, we're going to be dealing with one month at a time. Um, next month is twice as many letters as this month. So I'll probably skip through paragraphs that deal with too much art strategy. I'm going to have to do that, otherwise we'll never get through. So so the next one we'll do in two or three days and we'll that'll take us through um, May, right? And I think um, once we get to the second half of the year, things are really going to um, ratchet up because you're going to start going to brothels, is going to start feeling sick, is going to start Producing incredible art, but also his despair is going to go up kind of a few a few levels. Josie asks if you've got any news on Nisi's sister. I did get a very nice email from Nisi just thanking me for, um, you know, uh, putting putting the putting the link in chat and, and just acknowledging what was going on. Thanks a lot, Yvonne. Yvonne, I will try and put some of your artwork on up when I when I can get to it. Yeah, she doesn't know how much the blanket means.
So in the same way that Van Gogh was trying to create something soothing in his art, I was trying to create something soothing in this book where the fact that people's lives are so incredibly hard and tough and people are dying constantly, it's supposed to soothe you. You know, it's almost like, well, compared to that, my life is literally paradise. And it's hard to think about your life as um, that you're living almost the life of a king until you're aware of the hardships, like in incredible hardships other people have lived. And you get a little bit of a sense of that through the voyages of Magellan as well, which is why we're going to be dealing with the chronicles of bigger feta. You get a sense of being soothed and comforted in your own austerity, in whatever difficulty you find yourself in, when you see the incredible travails, fictional or factual, uh, that, that other human beings have gone through. So Stephanie's put up a link to the uh, GoFundMe, so check it out. Robbie says, thanks for the wonderful live. Thank you. Stephanie, thanks a lot for making it. I know you had quite a lot going on. Thanks a lot for being here. Uh, thanks also to the 30 plus of you who are uh, checking things out. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, as I say, I'm going to be doing the next Van Gogh letters every three days. So the next one will probably be like Wednesday or so. So there'll be 44 on Wednesday, 45 over the weekend. And then I'll try and do Chronicles of Pig of uh, Probably don't won't do it live, um, but I'll be doing that between the letters of Van Gogh. And then I'm going to try and look for the next narrative compared to the Voyages of Magellan. So if you guys can think of anything, excuse me, uh, some an incredible story, a true story. Uh, let's let's look at that. And then I might do another a read through a bloodline where we will go through artwork and uh, music and whatever. Um, maybe three chapters or so. I might do that between now and the end of the month. So, yeah. Uh, Stephanie says, praying, praying it is an option. Okay. Uh, I'll see what you're talking about there. Yeah, isn't it ironic that, that we dealing with Vincent van Gogh painting peach trees, painting peach trees blossoming? Isn't it ironic? So I just want you to, this is your homework, Terry, if you're watching. I know Terry always likes to get homework. I want you to think about how you are growing in the shade in some way and how you can solve that problem, not by blaming someone or feeling sorry for yourself or being overwhelmed, but by finding what it is you can do and also not having the expectation necessarily that you're going to find your way to the light where you say, okay, even if I don't find my way to the light, what I'm doing is right. What I'm doing is enough. What I'm doing is, is um, appropriate, right? I want you to think about that. Think about something that feels unfair and invalidating and how you can think your way, almost untangle your own psychology and say, find a way to validate that process so that you are not continuing to despair. Were you saying, I just need to continue doing this and not feel undone by that and not feel, you, you get what I'm saying? All you can do is focus on what, what you need to focus on, but also think about it in a different way where you think, what can I do that I'm not doing? How can I be more effective in a way that I haven't been before? Like in my case, one of the things I could do was, um, and it, it came at great cost and it came at great personal expense. And it's not necessarily that you should spend money. It might be we acknowledge that you made a mistake or whatever it is. Um, 
I one of the things that made my life easier was having the lights on. What can you do to improve your situation in a particular area? That's maybe a cost you don't want to pay, an investment you don't want to make, but maybe that'll help you get where you need to go. So, so think about that, and I hope you find your way to some solution in an area that's been uh, a challenge for you. If you want to share that, you're welcome to do that in the comments. Jalsi says, I'm doing it every day. Some days I succeed, other days I don't. So I have shared with you that another area that I feel like I'm the, she the tree growing in the shade is my brother is a lot fitter than I am. And so how do I solve that? And you know what my answer is? Train with him. Uh, do certain things with him. Uh, and, um, and then also train um, on my own. But that's part of, I think, the solution to that. And um, that is something that I've been doing a little. I can certainly be doing more of that. It's funny that you mentioned the Mo Wilson case because just before I came on live, I was thinking um, that's a case I really want to cover. That's that that's a case that not there's not a terrible amount of interest, but it's a case that I think means a lot to me. Okay, so I hope you guys, if you encounter someone who says what Vincent van Gogh was struggling with, you know, he had syphilis, we had bipolar disorder, we drank too much. Uh, I do see 37% ultimately said that he was lonely. Um, that, is, that is the thing. That's the thing that he needed to deal with. And think about it for him. How could he prop properly deal with his loneliness? And I think his solution was getting Paul Gogard to come and stay with him. Another solution could have been getting a dog. I don't know. Um, but you can see in, in his situation the challenge he was up against. And I do think what's so valuable about the letters of Vincent van Gogh is you go into the life of somebody else and you, you see just how challenging it is and yet he endures. And that's why it's just so, such an injustice that the story told about his life and his psychology is so totally freaking misguided. Anyway, we're just hitting three the three hour mark. Um, so I uh, wanna uh, thank everyone for being here. Uh, thank you guys for um, your wonderful interactions and comments and i'll see you guys next time for episode 44 where we'll deal with may things are definitely going to be warming up thanks everyone for being here um yeah that's definitely true i think that trial's coming up in june if i remember correctly i think it actually is the same day the same day of the day after uh, Koberger's preliminary hearing, something like that. Anyway, thanks everyone for being here. Take care. I'll see you guys next time.